first lectionary reading is from Micah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. And I'm going to try not to butcher these names. Hear what the Lord says. Rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the controversy of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you, and what have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you for the house of slavery, and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what King Balak of Moab devised, what Balaam's son of Beor answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with a calf a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Please remain standing. Let's turn to number 747 in the hymnal. <clears throat> Psalm 15. O Lord, who shall abide in your tent? Who shall dwell in your holy hill? The one who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth from the heart, who does not slander with tongue and does no evil to a friend, nor takes up reproach against a neighbor, in whose eyes a reproach is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who does not put out money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. The one who does these things shall never be moved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Good morning. Good morning. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. This morning, our altar flowers are beautiful. <laughs> we don't have anybody signed up for like the first three weeks of February, so if you'd like to treat someone and make them feel special, sign their name on there and we'll give them some very beautiful flowers. And we have the greeters listed there for this month. Our February activities on the 16th is Family Fellowship After Service at Gaddy's. On the 23rd at 3 p.m. is the Cedar Creek Assisted Living Service. On the 27th is the Appalachian Pregnancy Care Banquet. And if you plan to attend, see Sandy Penix. Then we have a March activity listed there for a service at the Louisa United Methodist Church. It's the Kentucky East Meeting. Any other announcements? If nothing else, we'll ask our pastor to come and lead us in prayer. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we come before you today, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you, Lord, for the breath and the life and the strength that we have to be here this morning. God, we know every day is a gift from the Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for the families that are represented here the morning, this morning, the children, the sounds throughout the sanctuary. And we want to pray, Father, God, today that you'd lead us and guide us in the way you'd have us go. And we want to pray for these special prayer requests that have been lifted up this morning. God, you know our needs and you know our hearts. You know what we stand in need of even before we ask. But we ask because, Lord, we know that uh, you have instructed us to do so. And, Lord, we, we want to pray for those that are in the hospital right now, those especially that have been mentioned and those on our hearts, uh, those that are co co-workers, uh, families, those that have lost loved ones uh, recently that have died and will be mourning their loss, God. We pray, Father, for our church, our church universal. And God, we pray that we could lead and guide the people of God and that we would 
continue to make disciples for Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And Father, help us to reach for that prize that Paul talked about. And let us go on unto perfection. Lord, there were those who believed that we could reach perfection in this life. I don't know. But I know, God, that we should keep reaching for that goal. And there will be a day, God, where you will allow us to stand without spot and without blemish before the Lamb of Jesus and before the throne of God. And we will cry out, worthy is the Lamb. So we give you thanks and we give you praise for all that you do today. In the name of Jesus. Amen.
Exactly. So sometimes when it rains, it's a bummer. We don't get to go outside and play, or we don't get to do something we thought it would. But you're exactly right. Just because it's hard for us, there's farmers out there who it's really, really helping. Right? Is that right, Libby? Exactly. So just because something hurts us, we can also see the other side in ways that it can help people. And then what's great is Libby brings her delicious vegetables here, and she feeds us with it. And it's extra great. <laughs> so sometimes when things aren't going our way, let's try to remember that there's a plan for it, and God has a plan, and ultimately, God's in control no matter what. And that's a pretty awesome thing. Huh? Okay? You guys want to pray real quick? Anybody want to pray here? Do anybody want to leave a prayer? Um, you want to leave it? leave it for us? All right, guys, let's pray. Larry says I can use my electronics to do this, so we'll, we'll do this. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right. Wasn't that wonderful? It was so beautiful. All right. So mine is Matthew 5, 1 through 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. That's it. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Sorry. Real quickly before we do this song, Larry had sent me a note earlier this week and said, um, "Do you think you could do this song?" And I was like, "Yeah, I, I think I can." But it's been a long time. Um, he didn't even know. Um, the morning of my mother's funeral, my dad called me and said, you know, this song has been on my heart. Do you think, you think you could find it and sing it? And uh, so I hurried up and we did that. And so I'm going to try to do this before I cry. But anyway, uh, I hope that you enjoy it. But this was a song that was uh, special to me, no matter when we sing it. Of course, there's other versions. and. Uh, I know the words are different wherever you go, but we're going to sing these. I am a poor wayfaring stranger traveling through this world. Bye. 
every trial this form shall rest beneath the sun I'll drop that cross of self-denial and enter in that home with God I'm going home to see my Savior I'm going home no more to I'm only going over Jordan I'm only How beautiful was that? Maybe we put that on our Facebook page. We can listen to it again. Our scripture text from the first chapter of Corinthians, beginning at verse 18. For the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written... I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to, the, to save those who believe. For indeed Jews ask for signs, and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block, and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong and the base things of the world, and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, that he might nullify the things that are, that no man should boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that just as it is written, let him who boasts boast in the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we know we are sought by the foolishness of this world. Help us through the opening of the scriptures to us today to seek after the truth of following you rather than the foolishness of the world. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Am I wrong or did he just insult us? Uh, I mean, it sounded like he was saying that we were foolish and ignorant. Um, 
maybe, maybe that was a misquote. Let's, let's look at it again. I want to make sure that what we're talking about here. Chapter 1, if you have your Bibles, I want to read this again because maybe, maybe Ron misquoted that or something. Verse 26 and 27. Uh, consider your own call. Reading from the New Revised Standard Version here. So we'll consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many powerful. Not many of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame, shame the wise. And God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. No, he, he read it right. He, uh, that's kind of uh, maybe offensive. Uh, you know, I mean, does he not, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul wrote these words, but apparently he didn't realize the congregation that he's referring to, maybe Corinthians, but not our church, surely. I mean, uh, you know, he didn't realize that, you know, I've been to seminary and we got with us today people who have teachers and lawyers and doctors and bankers and you name it. So he must have been referring to someone else, not us educated Methodists, right? Uh, surely he couldn't be talking about us. Uh, we, we could probably just dismiss this as referring to someone else. Uh, because that's, that's kind of sounds offensive today. And, and we live in a world where, you know, it's apparently Apostle, the Apostle Paul didn't hear of political correctness. Because that's just downright offensive to call educated people foolish. I mean, that's what it says. And, uh, you know, we live in a world today where you just don't talk like that. I mean, we, we spend most of our time now trying to build people up and, and to build up their self-esteem and tell them how good they are and how wonderful they are. And, and we just want to have accolades and then to turn around and say that they're foolish and ignorant and weak, well, that's what it says. Could it be that the Apostle Paul is trying to point out something a little deeper than that? I imagine that the Corinthian church were not unlike our church in a lot of ways. I imagine that they had people in their church, like our church, of all different backgrounds. And apparently they didn't have a lot of uh, people that were com completely educated, but there were some. And so there was a difference in different backgrounds. And so uh, maybe Paul is pointing out something here that's different. Maybe he's pointing to something greater than ourselves. Let's look at chapter 2. Uh, if you have your Bibles, um, and I encourage you to follow along with me uh, today. Uh, chapter 2, take notes if you'd like. Um, on Wednesday nights, we, uh, we kind of go over the Sunday morning sermon, and I usually give a little quiz, pop quiz, about what the uh, sermon was about. And uh, so they've learned to start uh, writing a few things down. But uh, chapter 2, uh, we're going to go back over to uh, Corinthians here. And he says in verse uh, 3, I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith must not, might not rest on human wisdom, but on the power of God. It seems to me that what the Apostle Paul is saying here today is that our wisdom is not enough. Our strength is not enough. Our faith is not enough. That we fall short uh, when it comes to the things of God. That the strongest, the wisest, the most influential, the most wealthiest person, when it comes to the things of God, fall short of the things of God. Our wisdom is just... Not enough. Look what he says back in chapter 1 and verse 18 there. He says, 
For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel message of the cross seemed foolish to the people of Paul's day. Not unlike the people of our day today. That the message of the cross might seem a little bit foolish. Um, because it was, as we'll see in just a minute, it was a stumbling block. And it was, it was offensive to some people to think about it. And so it, 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 to a lot of people it just didn't make sense to have a savior on a cross. A king on a cross was not what they had planned. It seems so foolish. Uh, going back over here again, look at verse 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. In verse 20, where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the, the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? You see, our salvation can never be wrought by human wisdom. It can never be wrought by human hands. Nothing we can do, the greatest of us, cannot make us acceptable to God. And that was something that Nicodemus even had a hard time. Nicodemus was trying to think of godly things from a worldly perspective, and it just didn't work. But the truth of the matter is, that we can never, ever attain the things of God. You, you can take all the wisdom in this church, and all the knowledge in this church, and all the power in this church, and the influence in this church, and you can put it all together, and it still comes way short of what we need. The Bible talks about sin as missing the mark. I'm thinking of a target, like, uh, you know, some of you guys that do uh, target practice, especially archery, uh, uh, Robbie, and you know, when, when you shoot that arrow and, and you fall short of that target or you miss that target, that's missing the mark. We all miss the mark, by the way. We all come short. And what I'm talking about, you may compare yourself to someone out around you and say, well, I'm pretty good compared to this fella. But when you can compare yourself to the standard of God and the holiness of God, we fall short every time. Salvation can never be brought to us on human wisdom. And so our calling, that's why he says there's not many mighty called. Not many strong that are called. In verse 26... Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many powerful. Not many were noble birth. And the point of that, that says, it goes on to say, is God chose the foolish in the world to shame the wise. So that we can't look at ourselves and say, God chose me because I was wise. Because we can look around and see a whole bunch of idiots that God chose too. We can't say God chose me because I was powerful. Because we can look around and see a lot of people who are not powerful. We can't see, say God chose me because I'm beautiful because we can see a whole bunch of people who are not beautiful. And we realize there must be something else to this. Why did God choose me? Recently, I uh, went with Sandy to a, an event at Upike. It was a, uh, a fundraiser. And it was a uh, really nice event. Uh, and honestly, the only reason I got, in, got to go was because Sandy was invited, you know. And I, I realized I probably would never been invited. It was a, uh, a very nice. We got to go last year, too. And I, I happen to know that the food is very, very good. And, and so I've been trying to eat healthy and, and, you know, watch what I eat. And so I pretty much didn't eat lunch. I think I did a shake or something for lunch because I knew I was going to eat really good that night. And uh, so I went to this U-Pike event and uh, sort of fell in, uh, a little out of place, you know. Uh, but here I was, and I thought, well, I can't wait till I get there because 
I'll be honest with you, my, my main thought was getting some of that really good food. And so we're, what I found out when we, when we first arrived is um, they weren't eating yet. They, you know, they stand around for an hour or whatever and talk and greet and meet and greet. And so, uh, oh man, I'm already bummed out. I don't get to eat yet. I'm really hungry. And so they're walking around with these little platters, you know, uh, Mark, and they got these little toothpicks coming out of them, or the hors d'oeuvres, or whatever they call that. And and so I thought, well, I at least can get some of those. And it, I saw this one. This guy had had bacon wrapped around it, and I don't, I can't. Pr most of the stuff there, I couldn't pronounce the name of it, but it was really, really good. And so I'm like. I got to get some of that. Uh, so I'm standing there and Sandy's meeting and greeting and doing what she's supposed to do. But I have to be honest with you, she doesn't even probably know this, but I, my mind was somewhere else at that, that point. I'm thinking, uh, I, want, I want one of them servers to come over to me and bring that tray over to me. But for some reason, they never did. They, they, they kept passing us up. And I'm like, we're in the wrong spot here. So I noticed that uh, Governor uh, our former governor, Paul Patton, was getting all kinds of stuff brought to him, you know. So I thought, well, I'll just walk over there to Governor Patton. And so I make my way over to uh, Governor Patton. Sure enough, here comes this guy with that the bacon wrapped stuff and that toothpick. And he uh, offers it to Governor Patton. And as soon as I got there, the guy takes off, makes a beeline. And I know he saw me. Uh, he had to have seen me. And so for a second, I thought, well, I'm going to follow him. So I'm following through the crowd. I'm trying to catch up with him. Then I pass up Governor Patton. I thought, this, does, this is too obvious. I don't want to look like I'm stalking the server. So I, I go back to where we're standing and with Sandy and him. And uh, uh, you probably had no idea all this was going to do. Uh, so I'm standing there. I'm trying to engage in conversation. And I'm a little bit, uh, my mind's somewhere else just hoping that they would come over and bring that tray to me. And finally, I catch the eye of a server, and I give him the eye and a look. And he, he finally comes over to me, and I get a couple of those little delicious things. The food was wonderful. And, and I mean, it had a great time and all that. But, but you know, I decided the next time we go to something like this, I'm just going to hang out with the governor, you know, because I know he's going to get all the good food. So if you ever hear of somebody getting arrested for stalking the governor. It's probably me. But anyway, I thought about the fact that, you know, this scripture, when I was thinking of that, uh, you know, is it a, it, are you as amazed as I am that God would choose somebody like me to lead a congregation? Yeah, you don't have to agree. But <laughs> I'm telling you what, God has chosen, he really can say that God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Because every time I tell somebody that I graduated with that I'm a pastor and I lead a congregation and I'm a chaplain, they're like, oh really? You know, I can just see the shock in their eyes. But that's the way God does. God, is had, he just delights in doing the things that we wouldn't expect him to do. And the reason that he can do that is because he will take those things so that he will get the glory. Only God would get the glory. And I realized that so many times that, that God has, has, has blessed me in so many ways. And I understand that anything that good happens from this ministry and from this church, it's because God does it. It's not because of anything we do. You know, I can have the, the prettiest sermon and I can write some of the, you know, a really good sermon, but unless the Spirit of God touches it and does something with it and penetrates the heart of the people out there, it is not going anywhere. And I know many times I fell on my face and I've realized that only God can help with those kind of things. And so I'm thankful today to know that we have a God who is in control. And we think about that. Uh, verse 20, look at verse 28. Look what he says. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not to reduce nothing to nothing, things that are, verse 29, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. And here's the thing. We understand. You and I have nothing to boast about. All of our degrees, all of our trophies, all of our efforts, all of these things are futile when it comes to to the things of God. They will not earn us one day in heaven. 
They won't be enough. And you can work your fingers to the bone, and it's not enough when it comes to knowing God. It's only by the grace of God. My mom used to sing a song. I used to help her sing a song about the love of God. Until you know the love of God. You could own all the world and its money. Build castles tall enough to reach the sky above. If you could know most everything there was to know about life's game, still you know nothing until you've known God and His love. Until you've known the loving hand that reaches down to a fallen man and lifts him up from out of sin where he is trod. Until you know just how it feels to know that God is really real, then you know nothing until you know the love of God. And I believe that very much. And I'm not saying there that God doesn't value education. I believe that, you know, the Apostle Paul was very educated, and I believe that uh, uh, education serves us well and that we should do that. Uh, and it can make, it, I think it's made me a better preacher than when I, before I was educated. But at the same time, it's, the point is that we don't rely on those things to gain us, to, that, that we might think that we get somewhere with God, because that's not what it takes. And I'm thankful that you can look around, not only in church, but you can look around everywhere and see all kinds of people, people very uneducated, some who can't even read or write, that are preaching the Word of God. Because it doesn't come from human wisdom. According to the Bible, we didn't choose God. He chose us. And He didn't choose us because of our smarts or because of our potential or anything like that. He chose us because He wanted a people for Himself. My mom used to say sometimes when I was getting a little too cocky, you're getting too big for your britches. And maybe that's the problem with the Corinthian church. Maybe they had gotten to the point where they thought they were better than they were. But you see, the smartest person among us today is foolish in comparison to the wisdom of God. And the strongest person among us today is weak compared to the power of God. Look at verse 30 in, in the text today. Look what he says. He is a source of your life in Christ Jesus. He is. Who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. All those things come from not our efforts but from God. In order that as it is written, let the one who boast, boast in the Lord. And so you see, it's not about, uh, it's, it's not saying there, uh, don't get me wrong, I grew up in an environment where uh, they kind of frowned on education. And there were those that when I went off to, to Bible college and seminary that, that thought it was a mistake. And some would say, and some did say that I was a better preacher before I went. I, I don't happen to agree with that, but I believe today that, that God wants us to, to, to learn and to grow and all the things, but not that we depend on these things. Not that we pat ourselves on the back and say, boy, I sure did a good job. No, we understand that it's all because of God. And I feel like we need to say something about this word called and chosen. As we look at this passage, understand what the Bible is talking about uh, uh, when, it, when he says that we are chosen by God. That God chose out of the, so many people. And there's a lot, there's different beliefs on this and today, but I want, I don't have time to really develop this right now. But basically, uh, I want us to understand that in, uh, in different circles, you'll find different understandings of what this means. And it really usually falls along the lines of some will say uh, that, that we're elected or non-elect. And the doctrine of predestination is at the center of this. Now somebody might say, well, I don't believe in predestination. Well, then you don't really believe the Bible. 
because the Bible talks about predestination. Turn to uh, Ephesians chapter 1 in the book of Ephesians. And I, I, like I say, I, you'll have to do a study on this on your own. Maybe you already have. But in Ephesians chapter 1, he says in verse 5 that he predestined us or destined us for the adoption of his children through Jesus Christ a good, according to the good pleasure of his will. And he, he goes on to say that it was, uh, some versions say, in, uh, before the foundation of the world, that God predestined those in Christ. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you ask, it depends on what, what camp you fall from. Uh, and, and I'll give you real t two real quick. You can write these down and study them later. But one is the uh, Armenian version. And the other one is the Calvinistic version, Calvin version. Armenian comes from, uh, some people called him James and some Jacob. But it was actually uh, Jacobus. And he was, uh, this is where the thought come from. He disagreed with Calvin. Jacobus was a Dutch Reformed Dutch theologian. And him and Calvin disagreed in a couple things. They both agreed with a lot of things. But when it comes to uh, the doctrine of predestination, uh, Calvin believed that certain people were elected or selected and others were not. That would be the ones that would go to heaven. In other words, in eternity past, God said, I'm going to choose you and choose you and choose you. In the very fact that he chose you, some he didn't choose. That, therefore, you were not chosen. That's one school of theology known as Calvin. Uh, now, Arminians said, no, no. Uh, yes, God does know the number and God knows who will be in heaven. But he based his choice on those who would come and accept him, those that would believe in him. So later on comes John Wesley, and him and George Whitfield got in some heated debates over these things. Uh, Whitfield was more Calvinistic, and Wesley was closer to Arminian, and he agreed on most everything, but he did not agree with the doctrine of unconditional, uh, irresistible grace and unconditional election. And so they had some uh, private meetings that, that eventually kind of spilled out in, in public, and they wrote some stuff, and uh, they disagreed on some things. And which one is right? Well, I'll let you figure that one out. I'll be honest with you. We've been debating this for thousands of years, and we haven't settled it now. And I, to look at that as one of those things that's sort of paradoxical in the Bible, I don't understand it. Because you can read scriptures that makes it sound one way, and then read scripture that makes it sound the other way. And I don't really understand it. I'll just be honest with you. I'm not going to give you an answer, uh, but I, I, do, I do believe that we all have a choice. So if that's an answer, let it be. Uh, but when it comes to what's known as, uh, what some refer to as irresistible grace, which means that all the elect will accept God eventually. And uh, so you have the Calvinistic side and the Arminian side, and I'll let you uh, figure that one out. But I do believe this. God does know. God knows from eternity past to eternity future. But I also believe that God gives you and I a choice. And that choice is up to us if we want to accept God or reject God. But know this, that God does not base his choice on our wisdom and our intellect, on our power, on our influence, on our anything like that. But I believe that God does you know, call us to do service for him. Not based on any of those things. And the last thing he says there was he talks about the fact that we will not have anything to boast about. The song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us, says it best. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today as the musicians come. Father, today, 
These are things that are very, very difficult to explain or to understand. And so we admit, God, that we come to the mystery of God not having figured out God. But that's okay. That's a good place to be. But today, Lord, there are those here that maybe uh, haven't figured out today that where they stand with God. And I pray, Father, that they would make this a priority in their life to get where they need to be. In Jesus' name, amen.